Hey everybody, welcome to the webinar. This is with BenQ, Calibrite and Wilkinson's Cameras, who there's going to be a code at the end of this for some discounts from their store. But what we're going to be looking at today is still life photography with gels. Now, this is kind of a setup I've done before, and it's for a workshop that I run, which is on the trends of photography. And I know what you're thinking, I'm wearing double denim, how much does he know? But this is what I do for a job. So I'm going to sort of give you a bit of an insight into this and show you how it all works. Now, for a bit of context, I work as a commercial photographer. I have a lovely agent, an agency called Lisa Pritchard Agency, who represent me. And we shoot sort of big campaigns for the likes of Greg's, Papa John's, Pepsi, and all the rest of it. And what I am all about is very bold and graphic work. So it's going to be very much along those lines. And what we have today on this very small but very busy set is a simple shot of a lollipop. And what I'm going to do, first of all, is talk you through the entire setup and the theory behind it. And then I'm going to show you how to do it and then how to color grade it. So we've got Capture One running as well. You may need to switch between screens if you're on a mobile phone, um, but if not, you should be able to see both of them. So first things first, let's start with the camera. I'm quite old fashioned. I've got a 5D, uh, 5DSR, I think it's called. It's a DSLR, not a mirrorless, it's 50 megapixels. I use this for all of my test shoots and any job that kind of comes in at under five grand a shot. So this is my bread and butter workhorse camera. Just check the shutter actuations on it. It's 145,000 and it's still going strong. In front of this, I've got my 50 millimeter Secor lens. Lovely bit of kit. We've gone for 50 today because we're going to be photographing a lollipop. It's a child's bit of food. And I want a bit of distortion and a bit of fun in there. And 50 millimeters up close does distort despite what camera manufacturers will tell you. Then this massive monstrosity of stuff over here. This is my Cambo Actus. It makes my DSLR into a view camera, like a proper old school four by five with tilt, shift, swing, rise and fall. Very useful bit of kit, but you certainly don't need it for this because we're shooting straight on. There's no benefit to any of the real movements here shooting straight on a subject. That's the camera. And before anyone asks, this massive tripod here is actually called a salon stand. Um, it's just a big bit of metal by Manfrotto and just keeps the camera nice and stable. Now we're shooting this tethered into my laptop over here and it's coming by this tether cable straight into Capture One. And this allows me to see what I'm shooting as I'm shooting it. My laptop is on a small little monitor down here. It's only a 13 inch. Then I've got a massive 32 inch BenQ 4K monitor here. Interestingly, I don't calibrate this monitor um, and there's a reason for that. But normally, and especially for this sort of work, I do use these calibrators. This is a Color Checker Display Pro and they do a few different models. And I calibrate the monitor I am editing on. The reason we don't bother calibrating the one out here is because I've got lights coming from all over the place. I've currently got video lights showing on me. We've normally got LED lights on the ceiling, window light coming through. It's just impossible to calibrate it at any given moment. So calibrate my main editing machine, but the one which is rolled around in the studio, we just kind of let it run wild and, and kind of hope for the best, knowing that we can probably fix it with post. On to the lights we're gonna to use today. Now I've got some quite powerful lights here. I've got two different ones. I've got a Pixapro light here, which is also known as Godox. And then I've got a bronze color light there. The reason I've got two different brands is nothing special. It's just because the modifier I wanted for the bronze color light was slightly out of reach. So we've got a 1200 watt Pixapro here and it's got an optical snoot on the front of it. Then back here, we've got a 1600 watt bronze color light and it has got one of the greatest modifiers ever made. It's a zoom reflector. So this reflector here, you can zoom it in and out to give you different degrees rather than changing to different reflectors. They don't make them anymore. They're brilliant. They should keep making them, but for whatever reason, they've stopped. I then got my lollipop over here and it's on a nice little science stand and it's being held in what you'd normally put your test tube in when you have your Bunsen burner underneath it. If you want this sort of stuff, go and look at school supply shops. They're really useful for any sort of grip to hold things for photography. You don't pay the same premium that you do if you buy a photography kit, which is also rather nice. Then swinging around to the back, we've got a piece of dark gray card over here. Um, and, and as one pointed out earlier, there's a tennis ball on the end of this. That is because when you're on a set and you're a bit stressed and you're flapping around, these tiny metal pointy ends of everything suddenly become invisible until they're in your eye. So we always put tennis balls on the end of anything sharp. So that's roughly the kit we're using here. 
gives us a great starting point. But what we're looking at is shooting with gels. Now, the reason we're looking at shooting with gels is because it's just become in fashion. If you live in the UK, there's a supermarket called Waitrose and a supermarket called Marks and Spencers. Both of these supermarkets are very traditional kind of middle, upper middle class supermarkets. Both of them shot their last two campaigns using coloured gels. And as photographers, it's very important for us to understand the trends. We've just spent a whole month on a workshop doing this where we're just looking at what's coming up because doing something because it's technically impressive is kind of great for other photographers. But if you want to make a living from it, it's kind of redundant. Um, but this has very much come back into trend again. So I'm going to walk you through how I do it. Now, we're going to start with the background. The background I've got here is a light grey. The background you choose to shoot gelled lighting on is very important. The brighter the background, the more pastely the tones will have the potential to be. The darker the background, the more saturated they have the potential to be. And then you get to a certain point where the background's so dark that it just looks really ugly. But I find a mid gray is a great starting point and where you can sort of go up or down either way, depending on taste in post-production. Now, something that I always like to do is grab a photo straight away. Let's check we're still tethering here. I don't know if anyone else has upgraded their um, Apple recently, but uh, tethering not so hot since the latest update. Now, the first thing we want here is a completely blank frame. You'll see there's a tiny catch light. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but if you can, there's the tiny catch light. That's been caused by the video light on me here, but normally it would be completely black. I've gone for 125th of a second because, as I mentioned earlier, this camera has a very high shutter count at the moment. Um, Canon cameras, as the shutter count goes up in portrait orientation, the sync speed goes down. I don't understand why. It's fine in landscape, but in portrait, it struggles. So 200th of a second in landscape is fine, but 125th is really the limit in landscape, uh, portrait, I apologize. So we're gonna get that shot first. We've got the 125th of a second, 100 ISO, because on this particular model, it's best. On different models, you get different best ISOs. And then I'm at f22. Now you're probably going to say you're going to get diffraction Scott, at f22, and I probably will, but nobody's probably going to notice. The reason we've got f22 is because we're currently three inches away from the lollipop, and even with focus stacking, it's going to be about a million shots. So that that's where we are at the moment. Now I've got some gels up here, and I've actually got two sets of gels out because someone in my Facebook group asked this question earlier, and it is an important one. Not all gels and not all colored lights are created equally. These gels here, which I've stuck into picture frames, these are cheap gels from Amazon. And you can tell they're cheap because they're very hard and rigid. Expensive gels have this nice kind of rusty thing going on. I don't know what it is in the plastic that makes it like that, but a good test as to whether a gel is good is whether you can rustle it and fold it up. If it comes in a hard, firm plastic, it's just some cheap stuff that's been packaged in with something else. LED light, slightly different, and every light is slightly different. I'm not going to go into the deep depths of light science, but I'm going to give you a really quick example. If you have a high quality red light, you get a broader range of the color red. If you have a cheap LED that does red or a cheap gel that does red, you get the same power of light, but it comes into a much smaller part of the red channel. And because of this, you get clipping or those really ugly red colors. That's a really oversimplified version. If you want to see something really complex, there's some great YouTube videos with some scientists in it, um, which will, well, I couldn't bear it, but I'm sure some will enjoy it. So we've got the expensive gels up here and we've got our key light. I'm going to turn it on, on the pack. We'll just uh, pop the modeling light on for a second. Now, no matter what a gel manufacturer tells you, and how heat resistant they claim their gel is, nothing is heat resistant enough for a modeling light. So I'm gonna grab a frame here. And this is the method I use for all photography. I, I do obviously own oodles of light meters and all the rest of it, but I've also got this big screen over here. It's huge, I can see it, and I can see it's underexposed. So I'm just gonna turn the light up. There's no magic going on here. There's no special calculations. I've just gone from quarter power to half power. And as we take this shot, we'll see the colors change. There we go, that's much better. So we've got a bit of a colored background there. I still feel it's a bit muddy. I'm gonna go up a little bit higher. And you'll notice we're lighting the background first. 
We're going to ignore the light hitting the lollipop at the moment. That's for another, another issue. There we go, that's better. It's a bit, bit brighter. So I've got these two gels here, a blue and a red, and they're taped to a frame. And that's just letting me sort of control the light and get that nice gradation on the background, which I'm liking. Now, what I am actually going to do here, I'm going to flag off. And the flagging is when you get a bit of black and you cut the light off. I'm going to flag the light off just to show you what it will look like on the lollipop. There we go. So there we go. Just so you understand, we're just talking about the background at the moment. That's all we're interested in. I'm going to turn this off for the moment, just so we don't cause any fires in here. We've got the light coming through, we've got this beautiful gradation on the background from the red to the blue. And then we've got a blue lollipop in front. Now, red and blue are part of a color scheme that works quite well together. It's very primary, it's very bold. A purple might be better, but I set my purple gel on fire during the workshop. So we've got red and blue. We can play a lot with the colors here. And a really important thing to do at this point is to jump on the computer, which is what I'm gonna do now, go into Capture One, and I'm going to have a quick look at the levels. Because we're shooting in just specific channels, we want to make sure that all of that data is there. And you see how it suddenly breaks up in the blues and reds and just see exactly what we have and what we don't have. And that's a really important step to take at this point in the game. You don't want to get to post-production and go, oh no, if I move my exposure by a third of a stop, the red channel breaks down. Cameras have what is called a bit depth. So alongside the issues we have with the colors of light, the cameras can also only record at a certain bit depth. These record at 14 bits, and then a phase one, for example, records at 16 bit. It doesn't sound like a big difference, but the difference is huge. Because when we're talking about bits, we're talking about millions of colors. So it's how many more million red tones they have. So you'll notice here, it'll go red, 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 and it'll go blotchy really suddenly. And that's because the camera doesn't have any of those different red tones in between. Whereas if you had a phase one, uh, the top of the line Fuji camera has this as well, and the Hasselblad does as well, you get the 16-bit the color, which makes a huge difference. It's far better than any resolution or dynamic range. Bit depth is one of the key components to good photography. But now we've got our background sorted. It's all kind of looking as I want it to. We now need to light our subject. So what I'm going to do here is turn off the background light and light the subject independently, just so I know exactly what I'm getting. So I know for now that this light without the flag spills. So we're going to turn on our key light, which is our Pixar Pro 1200, and it's in an optical snoot. We're going to want the modeling light on so I can see exactly what it's doing. So there's a bit of light that's coming through here. What I need to do is very carefully put it onto our subject. I'm just going to take one shot with it covered. Then one shot. Now we're not going to change our camera settings now because we've already got those correct for the background. So all we can play with is the light. Now I am at full power on 1200 watts and it's underexposed. The only thing I can do to get more light out of this is to move it closer. Now, because we're not worried about the inverse square law here and fall off of light, so we're just going to light the front of it anyway, that's not an issue in this particular context. Bit more still. Now in here, we have these little metal barn doors. There we go. So we can open and close to increase or decrease the amount of light. A little bit too much there. And you can see what I'm talking about with the clipping of channels. If I just reset the edit here, as we push that, it's a little bit too far. You can see how all of a sudden they go blotchy. That's when you've reached the limit of the bit depth. Now I like the light on the lollipop. I like the extreme fall off but I want some light on the lollipop stick as well. Now this is the sort of thing that can drive me slightly insane trying to get it right, but we'll give it a good go.
to small movements, carefully trying to get into place. Let's try that. Okay, that's close, so we need a little bit more light still. So we can get a little bit closer in. So at this point, our light is about six inches away from the subject at 1200 watts. If you're thinking of buying an optical snooch, make sure you have at least a 1200 watt light. You just you need that just to get any sort of exposure out of it, using it in any meaningful way. If you're ever wondering why brands make 3200 watt lights, it's for modifiers like this. Now, something I use in all of my shots is one of these. It's an x white color checker. Now, we have a problem with this shot, though. If I put this color checker behind the gelled light, it's going to do us no favors whatsoever. All we're going to get is it's trying to correct all the colors and changing what we've actually got. When you shine a red light over all of these, it makes everything a completely different color. If you correct it, you no longer have that red light. But what we do need is a correct white balance. Now, if we were shooting with a wider beam of light here, I would place the entire checker in front of the shot. But because it's such a slither for this particular shot, we're just going to try and get the gray card in front of us here within the light. There we go. And we're going to take a white balance from that. Just come up here, select a white balance. There we go. Because what we want is to at least have the correct white balance. Because if you try and correct this on the screen afterwards, when you've got colored jowls, a colored suite, it's so hard to get it right. At least this way here, we've got a really good starting point. So we can look at the lollipop now and we see from there, the lollipop stick looks the right color. And if we go back to what the camera thought was right, which was up here, it's quite green. So we've gone from that to that, which is good. I like that. It's very good. Now. We've got the lights kind of set at this point. So what I need to do now is focus the camera. I am going to focus on the nearest part of it, which is not what I'd normally recommend. Normally I'd recommend making a calculation for the depth of field with one third before and two thirds after. But I know from basic physics that there's no way we can get the shot in focus without focus stacking it. So I focus on the nearest possible bit with a mind to focus stack the entire image and pull it together in post. I won't show that on here, but it's pretty straightforward. You jump it into Photoshop, auto align, auto blend based on sharpness, and you get your stacked image. But we're going to start here. So that's good. We've got now the front shot and the back shot separately. Now, the tricky bit here is we now need to balance the two exposures. So we're going to turn this backlight back on again. I'm going to manually hold my flag in place. I'd normally use something like a stand to hold this here, but th there's so much carnage going on, I'm surprised I've not tripped over something already. So we're gonna bring this in to flag that light off. And we're gonna get our first shot. Okay, it's not as far off as I thought it might be. So if we have a quick look in here, and again, the first thing we do when we've got our first nearest shot is we do a quick grade just to see where things break down. I really like the sculpting of light here. Bring in some clarity. I, I particularly like the punch clarity, so it's personal preference. And then as a really quick sharpen, we just go to pre-sharpen two. I kind of like the look of that. And of course, we then zoom in, look at all this digital noise we've created and that lovely bit of sensor dust. And we're just gonna add some grain. There we go. Take that digital edge just away a little bit. Okay, so we're getting there. We've got this shot in place, but now we've got a new issue. In order to get this right, we've got a burnt out lollipop stick. Now, yes, the easy answer here is to take that burnt out lolly stick, take a previous exposure and blend them together. But I, I like to get things right in camera. So let me just grab this one little tool. This is called cleverly a net finger. Um, it is basically some mesh on a, a supposedly finger shaped bit of thing here. 
So we're going to turn off the background light again because I don't have enough hands to do it all in one go. And we're going to bring this in and we're just going to cover up some of the light at the bottom of the lollipop stick. And we're just trying to balance the exposure. Most of still life photography is messing around with tiny bits of kit like this, trying to make something balance out which doesn't quite work in camera. Excuse the rustling, there we go. So that wasn't enough. So now what we're going to use is some cine foil. Now cine foil is great because you can mold it into shapes. So you can see this, but if I just take this foil, you can kind of literally put it in a right angle and it stays there. This is actually heat resistant. It claims to be heat resistant and it is. So we can use this to literally flag off a bit more of this. Now I can use the barn doors, but the barn doors are too, um, too close already. If I go any further, I just lose the entire bit of light. If you buy a more expensive one of these, like a one color one, you can get really precise. Um, but this, I mean, I think these are like five, six hundred pounds. They're pretty good for the money. So what I'm doing now is I'm just molding a shape, which is going to fit in there. I'll cut it down to size a bit. And we're just going to try and sneak it into place. Now, with these things here, the closer it is to the light, the softer the fall off. Still a bit too much. There we go. And the closer it is to the subject, the harder the fall off and the crisper the shadow. So this is, this is known as a go-between or a gobo. And it works exactly the same as in the dark room. If you've ever been in the dark room and you're dodging and burning, the closer your bit of paper or your dodger or dabber is to the paper, the sharper the line is it will create. And the closer it is to the light and further away from the paper, the softer and more gradated it will be. It adds more between the umbra and penumbra shadows. So it's really useful. So I like the one we had previously. And at this point here, we can just use that lollipop stick as a perfect like example. So it's just, again, carefully bringing it in. And it's not always having it face on. It's sometimes just slightly off. We're just trying to add the tiniest bit of shadow in there. Still not quite enough. And then what we'd normally do on set is we'd bring in another C stand. And with that C stand, we'd tape this exactly into place. Just hold it in there. But I'm trying not to create the world's most elaborate trip hazard for myself. There we go. So double check the focus again. So nice and sharp on the front. Very good. OK. So we've got that. We'll go to the background light again. And all I want to do now is really fine tune this. So you can see without the flag on that lollipop, how much extra light we're getting spilled in here. And my natural sort of thing to do in this situation would normally be to grid this. But if I grid this, it's also having that honeycomb effect on the background, which is not what we want. Okay, so what we're going to do now is go all the way up to full power on this pack in the background. I'm not sure if you can hear the pop of the light on the camera or not, but it's uh, quite a lot of light. You definitely wouldn't want to stare into one of these. That's full power. Now we're going to turn it all the way down. Now it's going to be our minimum power. A little bit more. There we go. Now you can see we're going up through the exposures now. So that's quarter to half. And you'll just see as we slowly fine tune in the exposure in the background. Still not quite. See, it looks a little bit muddy still. So it's got a little bit higher up again.
that looks nicer to me. And this is just my opinion. I like the colour balance we have going on at the moment. It's quite bright, it's not too much. We've not done anything to the colours or saturation yet either. We've just done contrast curves and that's it. So we're kind of in a good place here. Let's turn this off again before we start a, start a fire. Oh, hold fire. Hey Siri, I like the colour. My laptop started listening in to me. There we go. So we're pretty close here. Now, a couple of key pointers. When you're setting your background exposure at the start, keep in mind when you're trying to get that perfect colour, you need to know that your foreground light's going to have enough power. If this was a 500 watt light up front here and I'd have set that perfect background exposure, I'd be in a really tricky spot. So it's important to have a basic understanding of light. I've chosen F22 at 100 ISO. I know that's going to need a lot of light. I've also got bellows here focusing my camera. And as those bellows get further and further apart, it eats up more and more light. If I was on a standard 50 millimeter lens, I wouldn't need this much light at this distance. I've probably gained an extra two stops of flash needed for this. When you're choosing your camera settings, I think it's really important to have a very sound reasoning for it. So for me in this instance, F22 means I don't have to stack too many images. Now, if I wanted absolute perfect op optical quality on this particular lens, I'd choose F16. But sometimes practicalities outweigh that. And it's like, I don't know when you'd ever see an image at such high resolution outside of the fine art world where diffraction becomes a real issue. So I think for F22 for me, because I've got the big light, it works fine. But if you don't have big lights, if you don't have loads of 1600 watt lights at home, and why would you? All you'd need to do is change the exposure. So we'd probably go to F8. So if you imagine this is 1600 watt lights, F16 is 800 watts, and then about F11 is a 400 watt light. So if we just take that shot first of all, with just the key light, we'll just adjust everything again. And I'll show you how it still works at different variable lighting. So we've gone from one down to a quarter. Super. And then on this pack here, doesn't quite give me the same options, uh, but we'll go from one to just below half, just below a quarter, like that. Super. And you'll see, I'm just going to pull these both up on the screen together. They're not identical. There's a slight discrepancy in that, and that, that is for many reasons. One of which is F11 is not exactly F11. Um, and two is this broncolor pack at the background doesn't have the same way of moving the power exposure to the one at the front. It's slightly off. But they're incredibly similar. I actually couldn't tell you which one's which looking at it from here. The only difference is depth of field, and I can tell you now the left one's got a greater depth of field. But if we zoom in, they both look pretty sharp to me. They both have good contrast. So it's not about having the big lights. There's always a way around it. You don't need this big kit. The only reason I'm using it for this seminar is because I don't have anything else. Um, I, I gave all of the smalling lighting away when I got the studio because when you've got space, you might as well have big lights. So you don't need that to do it. You can see it even here on your screen share, I doubt you can tell the difference in sharpness. I'd say the right image might have a slight edge on sharpness at 100%, but then I don't remember the last time I saw an image at 100%. So, you know, there's a lot to unpack within that. Now, if you don't have something like an optical snoot, again, there are options. I would recommend that everyone goes out and buys a roll of Cinefoil. I'm just going to work out the brand it's called. Oh, it's by Roscoe. Roscoe Cinefoil. Comes in like a, a blue packet, and you could make one of these yourselves. We wouldn't have the optics on the front to focus the light, but to be honest, this one here is not particularly great. But all you need is to take this bit of card, you'll cut your, or foil even, cut the slit out the centre, like so. And then we've got the exact same thing here. Now this is a very rough example of it, so I'm not convinced it's going to work and probably doing it in the middle of a live stream is not the wisest decision in the world, but that's never stopped me before. Okay. 
I'm going to need a reflector. So I've got my reflector. It's just a standard Bowen's hyper reflector, I think it's called, which is a side note for pure reflecting purposes or a nightmare because they cast a double shadow. And then we're going to place this over the front of it. Just turn this one off so I can see what I'm doing. So we've got the full light, this bare bulb there, which is going to be horrifically bright. And we'll just try and trim it down. Getting there, just need a little bit of a smaller cut in it. Again, we'll take some trusty gaffer's tape. Just to make the whole I've cut in here a little bit smaller, I'm just going to tape this up a bit. We'll uh, half the size of it. There we go. Again, we'll just place this over here. Still a bit too much of a large. Getting there. A little bit of light leaking out the back, which is what's causing that blue cast. Almost, we just need to turn this down a bit. Turn this one on. See if we can do it all in one shot. Just about balancing it all. There we go. It's not quite right. It's a bit overexposed on the blues. The slit in this is cut a bit too far open, but we're not far off. If we just pull the exposure back, we compare this with all the fancy kit. It's not a million miles off. We can definitely fix most of those issues in post. We can definitely come in here and pull the highlights down, pull a bit of general exposure down, and all of a sudden the one on the right is looking pretty good. So it's not all about the fancy kit. You don't need to have optical snoots and stuff. That was just some gaff tape and some black cine foil. There's a load of things you can do with very, very limited kit. It's just about getting creative with it and working out what it is you're trying to decide from the lighting that you need to achieve from this. Now, I'm going to quickly show you how to shoot the focus stack part of this. Yeah. Okay, so whenever you're shooting a focus stack in any bit of software, the best thing to do at the start, so you know what you're doing, is get your initial focus on. So I've always used live view for this because my eyes are getting old. Focus on the absolute nearest part. Turn live view off. Then you put your hand in front of the camera and you take a frame. So you've got a clearly muddied frame. There we go. And that's frame one. So you can see where you're starting from now. We then take the first frame of the stack. And in my instance, I need to make the bellows get closer as we go further away. So we take one shot. Slightly just the focus, and we just keep going in the smallest increments possible until the entire shot goes completely out of focus. Now, if you're using a lens to focus instead of bellows, just slightly turning that around ever, ever so slightly each time. So, just keeping an eye on this over here. You can see now the lollipop sticks coming into focus at the bottom and those droplets. Still going. There we go. Uh, 
And now the whole thing's out of focus. We take our hand again, place it in front, take another frame, and that lets us know that all of those images are within our stack. So everything there is kind of within the same shot. We'll export those as TIFFs, and then we'll take those TIFFs into Photoshop to stack them. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you here is within the actual file. So if we take one of our good shots from earlier, there we go. What I'm going to do now is quickly dive into this software. So if we all look at the Capture One bit of it, and I'm going to show you this great feature called the Advanced Color Editor. But we literally come in, we select the color, we can then choose how much of it is going to affect. And I want this to go almost, and you see how red and blue go into each other halfway up here. I'm going to bump that saturation. Now watch this go blocky. That's where the bit depth struggles. See that? That's too far. So what we're looking for is that for me is the most color I can get out of this without it going a little bit, a little bit wrong. We're then going to take the blue. So we'll tick this again here. And I want this blue to come all the way around to here. And again, and we get that neon look, which I'm really a fan of. Um, now I feel like I haven't set the right white balance here. I'm going to take the white balance from this part of this. Oh, and now we've now we've got some problems. Now we've got some problems. Um, let's go back into the color editor. Let's open this up again. There we go. That's better. And then the last thing I would perhaps do is a little bit of dodging and burning. So I'm going to go for a mask. We'll draw a mask. I just want this one here just to have that little bit more oomph to it. So we're separating the blue from the background to there. And again, it's just this is a very quick mock-up, but raw file edit. Now I've gone full on 1990s lumosity because that's kind of what I like. You don't have to go this sort of extreme on the edit, um, but this the, the background specifically that kind of almost going into neon lighting look is very much in trend at the moment um, and it's just come in trend i've literally seen two shoots that have done it in my industry so i'm sure it's going to carry on because the brands that did it are very traditional brands it's not like them to go off after something like this unless it really is something people are interested in so that that's the simple setup for it and of course color gels come in all different colors Something which is worth having is one of these. You can get these on Amazon for like five pounds. It's a color wheel. And this just shows you all the different color options. So say you choose red and you want a triad of colors, you know, you can take blue and yellow. If you want split complementary colors, you can go for a yellow green and a blue green with a red. And it gives you all of that information. So if you don't have a huge history in art and a degree looking at classical like artwork or whatever it may be, this can be very useful. If you sit in there going, I don't know which colors to put together, this kind of has all the answers, and of course you can break the rules, but it's always good to have this as a solid starting point. Now what I'm going to do now, if you have any questions about this, if you pop them into the chat, I'll answer those for you. And yeah, that, that is the main practical part of this workshop. I hope it's been useful for you, and yeah, let's see if there's any questions, and we'll try and answer those as best I can. Oh, and before I forget, as I come into this sheet here, look at that, camera change, seamless. Um, there is going to be a code at the end of this for a discount from the Wilkinson's camera company. So if you do pop that into the chat, then people will be able to look at that. And that gets you discounts on BenQ and Calibrite stuff. And if you're looking to buy one bit of Calibrite kit, I think the most useful for most photographers is the color checker passports. Um, it's great, especially if you get to the point in editing where you're sort of doing shots which are all one color. So there's a real trend at the moment. I've just shot a whole series of images called an Ode to Jam, um, and it's this big blue set behind me. So everything was blue, and making sure the blue is the right blue in the right places is really difficult by eye. But if you shoot the color checker, it automates it for you, which just makes life considerably easier. Um, so, do we have any questions? What was the brown light in the background? Ah, there's a light in the background. I think it's slightly moved out of shot since I've done it. Let me let me swing it back in. It's over here. This is a hobo light video light. It's not doing anything to the set, 
bird. I'm not sure if you can see it from there. It basically looks like a Hasselblad camera body, but it's a light with, a, with an optical lens on the end, which is pretty cool. So I'm using those to shoot my videos at the moment. So uh, question from Charles. Um, do you worry about the ICC profiles and curves at all in the color management panel? Do I worry about them? No, not really. Um, we often create an ICC profile using the color checker passport, but for something like this, it's not really that useful because of the, you're basically basing the shot on your personal taste. There's no color accuracy you're aiming for. If you were shooting something where it was purely the product had to be the perfect color as it is in real life, we would look into ICC profiles. But for this sort of thing, not so much. Sometimes you can go for a flatter profile to maybe help you in post a little bit, but I've never really come across that, I don't think. How do you style the products in shot? I don't. Um, so if you, so I have two websites I have. Um, I have one called Tin House Studios, which is my YouTube channel and educational platform, but then my commercial photography website, which is scottchasino.com, every shot on there has been styled by a professional stylist. Um, they're so good. It, it also makes us look redundant. Um, Geran, I think that's how you pronounce it. Apologies if it's not. Do you just correct for color cast in post? Since I know brands have their colors, I worry about gels changing those. Ah, good question. So this, this kind of harps back to the ICC profiles. In terms of color cast, if we were shooting this for a brand and this brand was this lollipop, for example, and the lollipop had to be the perfect blue that it is, we would put more black flags around it in order to make sure we weren't getting any bounce back. So we don't really correct for color cast as much. Um, we just make sure the gels in the background are probably further away from the subject. I mean, I've got this all very close together on our set so we can show it on camera, but I'd probably have that background being a full size three meter background, 10 meters away and gel it back there and then have the lollipop miles away and build its own little microclimate for it so you can keep things separate. Oh, bear with me whilst I try and read without my glasses on. Um, glad to see you're using Capture One, but am I right in thinking you can't focus stack in it? If so, is there any free software alternative to Photoshop that I could use in parallel to Capture One? Um, I don't know of any good free software. Capture One, you'd need to go into Photoshop, or there is another bit of software called Helicon Focus, I think it is. Um, Oh, which is the next question, which says why Neil, surprise you focus stack manually. Um, is there any reason you don't use Helicon Focus or any other software? So I focus stack manually because if there's a problem, it's easier to fix. And I find there's often a problem. Um, Helicon Focus, when it works perfectly is brilliant, but I find fixing any issues in the stacking really difficult to do. Um, whereas if you do it in Photoshop, you can just choose the layer, brush it in, brush it out, and it's nice and easy to do. Um, how do you work with Pro Photo RGB with single photos and how do you control out of gamut colors? I don't, uh, <laughs> is the answer to that one, Matt. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't help with that. I don't use the Pro Photo RGB uh, for single photos. Um, in terms of controlling out of gamut colors, there's not, once the colors are gone, they're gone, um, I guess. So, I'll try to put this in a practical term. So for those who don't know what I'm talking about, it kind of comes back a bit to bit depth um, and it kind of comes into a bit of light. So sometimes the colors just, they, they, they're not recordable or they're not visible or for whatever reason it, it can cause, there's so many variables and it can cause all of this, all these issues. And there are some really technical ways you can do things to help control it. But an easier way, which is the exact same thing is just to change what you're doing. Uh, and I always find that to be a better option. So when a client's like, can you make this redder like this and you can't, I find a different way around the problem. Um, can you explain why you need a white balance again? Absolutely. So when we're shooting a shot like this, where there's lots of colors going on everywhere. Now we're quite fortunate this lollipop has a white stick. Um, 
But if it didn't have a white stick, if it was a blue lollipop and a blue and red background, the color for the white balance, which basically says, here's 18% gray, and here you can now work out what all these other colors are, because the camera doesn't know what red is. It works it out from what 18% gray is. If you don't have something in there telling you that, it's nigh on impossible to get it right in post. You can do it, and of course, professional researchers make it look like a breeze, but for mere mortals like myself, it, it just gives me mild anxiety and a headache. Um, is the focus pull tool inside Capture One good enough for focus stacking? This is from Demetrios. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, if we're using autofocus lenses, you have to have an autofocus lens. You can then stack the focus by just clicking on this micro just button. It's brilliant. Um, works really well. I definitely recommend doing that if you have an autofocus lens. I just don't own any autofocus lenses, so I, I kind of forgot it existed. Um, from Joe, with all the colors, what about printing? How do you make sure the color gels work on screen and then work on printed paper for big jobs? Brilliant question and very timely as well because I've just sent my portfolio to print. Um, so we're shooting here on a screen in um, sRGB and then on print it's CMYK. It looks completely different. Uh, we're looking at a backlit screen over here and my work when it goes to print for commercial campaigns it goes onto a six sheet, which is the side of a bus stop in the UK, which is the biggest resolution you can get, even though it's not the biggest print. We then go onto a billboard, which is like dot printing at ridiculously low resolution. It will go into newspapers, it will go into magazines, it will go into digital billboards. You don't ever try and control anything for print because there's too many variables, let alone after all those different print mediums, which all come from the same file. No ad campaign does different files for different mediums the lighting on the day changes exactly what it looks like. So all you need to do is get it right here, export it as CMYK, which thankfully Capture One lets you do, which is why pros use it and Lightroom does not let you do, which is why they don't. Um, send it out to CMYK, although often the ad agency just ask for RGB and then you, they do it for you and they print it and it looks how it looks. You know, nothing's ever perfect. You can't have it perfect. If you're printing like I've done for your portfolio though, um, you start doing lots of test prints because every ink, every printer and every paper stock looks different. So it's about making those micro adjustments alongside a good printer who you trust. We can go back and forth over time. And, you know, that's why printing a portfolio costs like two, three thousand pounds, um, but definitely worth doing it. Um, so from Bill, how do you deal with light bounce color casting from other items in your studio? Um, I don't. There's probably a lot of things that I should be dealing with that I don't. It's never been an issue is the honest answer. Sometimes I've got a yellow watering can in the corner of the room back there, and sometimes I can see that in a reflective item. Um, but even this massive blue set nearby, it is not causing any color cast because this current set is so small and so close, the light nearby at 1200 watts from five inches is not gonna bring anything else in there. There's not any time for light to bounce and come back within five inches. If I was shooting in a solid red room, I would put out some flags perhaps, but you don't need to worry about just like random items. It's not really an issue. Sometimes you have a stylist who annoyingly wears a red apron. That can again be a problem when they're really close, you have to tell them to get back for the final shot if there's any cutlery in place or anything reflective. But again, it's very rare they give a color cast. Um, it has to be really close. But on the flip side of that, I've actually started, and this is a bit of a sneaky pro tip, when we want to bounce light back in, sometimes we want to add to the shadow. So we'll bring a bounce card in and it'll be blue instead of gray or white. We'll bring it in really close and then you will get some color cast in the shadows, but it does have to be so close. Like it, this blue thing back here is not doing anything to the actual shots we're doing here. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things. It sort of can be an issue, but very rarely is. And when it is, you just put something in the way of whatever's bouncing it, whether it's white or black paper. Um, can you use gels to color the shadow of your subject? Good question. Yes, you kind of can. Um, if you shoot the gel directly at the subject, then the, sh the color falls into the shadow almost. Um, kind of a different approach to what we've done here. But yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, Garen, do you prefer gels or RGB lights? Would you sacrifice the power flask for RGB lighting? So RGB light, which is red, green, and blue, is an LED kind of format of lighting, and it lets you ch adjust it and change it. Um, the problems with LEDs is the, the best ones we use are 1200 watts and they are huge and they don't do those RGB things. Only the lower, weaker lights do RGB. 
So to go from 1600 watts to 400 watts for RGB wouldn't work in my style of work. Also, a red on an RGB light is not as good as a red on a high quality gel. Um, it, it makes the world of difference. I'd always buy a bicolor light, like blue to or even just like on and off um, light, where it just goes on and goes off and put a gel in front of it. I think it's a much nicer light. However, I did have a while when I was in YouTube videos and I had colored background lights. I did use RGB lights, so that just goes easier. Um, so from a sort of ease point of view, RGB lights are great, but in terms of technical proficiency, I'd always choose like a 1600 watt flash with a gel in front of it for that. Super. No more questions. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for having me, everybody. It's been a pleasure. And then, yeah, I, uh, I look forward to seeing all your images you take with gels. It's interesting to see. <laughs>